Hello and welcome to another episode of Gotham Sound TV. I am very excited to be talking about the Audio Limited A10 Rack with Gabriel Benitez from Sound Devices. Gabriel, hi. Hello, Peter. Uh, thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. Um, I really love uh, this product um, and I'm excited that we can share it with everybody. So let's jump in. Absolutely. Um, so first of all, uh, what is this product? The A10 Rack was designed to allow a sound mixer to repurpose their bag receivers and put them in a cart as a way to be able to switch from one format to the other. One format meaning like I could go from my bag to my cart and then back to my bag. Exactly. And they do that um, because it, it's using the standard Uniswap um, connector on the back, that DB25. That is correct. Every slot in the A10 has a 25 pin uh, connector, and that's how the A10 rack communicates with the receivers that are inserted. Uh, so, and four receivers, so it, meaning uh, each receiver in theory is two channels of RF, um, and eight audio eight audio pads out. That is correct. The receivers that are compatible with the A10 rack are the Electrosonics SRBs, the SRCs, the Wizicom MC42, mm -hmm. and the A10 receiver from Audio Limited. And all those receivers are dual channel. Mm -hmm. So whatever, however you have it populated, um, those receivers basically uh, you'll have uh, two channels, uh, two outputs per receiver in the back of the A10 rack. Uh, fantastic. And uh, I guess, you know, I'm curious to know, besides the ability to go back and forth, what else about this rack uh, would appeal to sound people? What, el what other features does it have? Well, the I think the, the biggest appeal outside of repurposing your receivers is the fact that it has a Dante card built in. Mm -hmm. So you can take a receiver that's traditionally not a Dante receiver, uh, like a Electro SRB, for example, it's an analog receiver, but uh, using the A10 rack with the SRB, we'll get those SRB audio channels onto a Dante network. Uh huh. Uh, Sound Devices has a couple of Dante recorders. Yes, we do. We have the 970 recorder, uh, and that's a 64 track uh, digital recorder with Dante. And it will be a great way to integrate anything you have in the A10 rack and go straight into uh, into the 970 recorder that way. But it doesn't just have Dante; it's got analog out. Correct. And um, and AES out. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, let's look I at think the back. we can uh, we can turn this around. We can flip this over. And show the back of the receivers. You bet. So we have. Um, okay, I'm going to go over here. So uh, if you're using the analog outputs of any of these receivers, uh, you'll have analog output one and two for the first slot, three and four for the second slot, five and six for the third slot, and seven and eight for the fourth slot. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the A10 receiver, internally you can switch it from... Oh, my ADD wants me to do this, I'm sorry. Uh, that's all right, there we go. There we go. Right. So if you're using the A10 receiver in the menu, you can switch from analog to digital. Mm -hmm. And if you do switch it to AES, then uh, this output, like in this case, we have an A10 in the first slot and an A10 in the fourth slot. So the uh, if you set them to AES, you'll get channels one and two out of this XLR connector. Got it. And then if you do the same thing on the other side, you'll get it out of that. Otherwise, if you're using analog, you use straight uh, the, the the XLR connectors. I'm uh, curious. Um, I, th I thought that the decision to do um, AES was really interesting. What what was the logic behind it on Sound Devices' part? Well, I think the, the decision to go AES is more on Audio Limited's decision mm -hmm. because they knew that their their receiver was going to be able to operate both analog and AES. So uh, let me just uh, make sure I understand something. Is the AES active regardless of whether the receiver is capable of generating AES or does the receiver generate the AES? The receiver generates the AES. Okay, so it's only going to work if the receiver can... Th that is correct. Okay, and Let's say the A10 at rack is out of the question. You mm -hmm. just have an A10 receiver in a mm -hmm. bag. Mm -hmm. You can manually switch it to AES mm -hmm. and then take that one output and connect it to the AES input of your recorder. Got it. 
Okay, that's so, great. Um, but the other thing I wanted to show in the back uh, is the, the the Dante connector. Yes. So you get your primary and your secondary, and you can use a Dante connection independently from this. So you can use Dante only. You can use them both at the same time, or you can use these and not use the Dante. It all depends on how you want to. Um, it all depends on how you want to uh, configure the system. Yeah. The other thing I want to talk about is that it's DC powered, so it's uh, obviously uh, designed to operate in a rack. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to get to the USB connector in a moment, Good. but um, I want to talk about the uh, the RF inputs and outputs. Yeah. So these uh, these are the RF ends right here, uh, the A and B antennas. But then in the middle, where it says output, that is the cascade output, mm -hmm. and the 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 purpose of the cascade or other people call it daisy chain, sure. is to get another A10 rack on the same uh, antenna connection. So um, it, is it set up for unity gain? So in other words, um, it's not a passive split. It's, it, it's a, an active split. It's an active split. It's an active right. split. And so if you need to get uh, 16 channels of wireless on two antennas, mm -hmm. you can simply just take those antennas on your cart connect it to the first one, take the outputs of the first A10 rack and connect it to the input of the second A10 rack, and uh, they'll work perfectly. And the A10 racks are completely wideband, so you can throw the receivers around at, you know, to your heart's desire as far as where you want them mechanically and physically located in, in, in the car. In interesting. Um, the one thing to note is you don't want to cascade more than two mm -hmm. because because it's an active uh, split, yep. um, anything more than two would increase the, the noise floor within the system yes. to a point where it won't be helpful for any of the receivers in the third cascade. Right. So one of the questions that I often get is, how do I get more than two A10 racks on the same pair of antennas? And the answer is that you passively split the antennas first. Mm -hmm. So you would take in this case, we have these two antennas, and you feed each antenna into a passive splitter. Mm -hmm. And it's important to use a high-quality passive splitter Correct. that is linear across all the frequencies that the passive splitter uh, is labeled uh, to operate in. Yes. You want to avoid using the traditional BNC-T connectors right? because those are linear. They are tuned typically into a certain frequency range, and it's... And then as you go towards the end of the operating range of the receiver, you'll, you'll see it, you know, the sensitivity tapering down. Sure. So um, maybe some brand names might be like Mini Circuits or RF Venue or Electrosonics. Does Electrosonics, that... RF Venue. If you want to if you want to work outside of the uh, traditional production sound brands, Professional Wireless is another professional alternative. Professional Wireless, yeah, absolutely. And I yes. named them because... Uh, Another place for the A10 rack to live is in an actual studio. Mm -hmm. And permanent, like fixed studios typically use fixed rack mounted wireless systems mm -hmm. and not so much that having to go between a bag to a rack. And you'll find brands like Professional Wireless in those environments. Because they do a lot of infrastructure, RF infrastructure. Yeah. yeah they're a great company. The, the company them. does. Yeah. RF antenna design, yes. networking, and things like that. So that's another brand that I, I personally have used, and I and definitely recommend them. Me too. So yeah. uh, those would be that would be the first thing to do is to passively split the antennas using a high quality passive splitter, and then the output of each passive splitter would feed uh, an A10 rack. I, and then the yeah. cascade of each of those would follow into the next one, and that's how you get four A10 racks on this on the same pair of antennas. Got it. Got it. And you're a little bit. You, you lose 6 dB with the passive split, or 3 dB. 3, yeah, right. depends on how much. It could be yeah. anywhere between 3, 3.5 three dB. Right. Uh, the, the manufacturer of the splitter will tell you what that is. But you can compensate the passive, the loss in the passive split by using directional antennas. Yep. So log periodics typically have about 6 dB right. of forward gain, and that would that would compensate for the for the passive split. Right. Uh, yeah, we could go in any number of directions because I uh, I also appreciate the use of passive antennas. I love as well. going passive as uh, well. Passive and right. dual shielded, <laughs> yep. high quality RF coax is. Yes. Don't go cheap on the antennas and on the cables because nope. if you do, you'll hear about it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you'll suffer. Um, yeah, exactly. But I also I I do want to talk about. Um, 
sort of infrastructure use of this um, style of rack mount. Okay. Um, you know, I, I've been on a number of jobs and certainly, um, you know, talked to a number of customers where they use um, other manufacturers' rack mount solutions, which, uh, you know, are fine. Um, but when something breaks, it becomes a challenge to replace it in a hurry. Correct. Um, so, you know, what I'm talking about are designs where um, all the receivers are permanently and can only exist as receivers in the rack mount. Yeah. Um, and it's great because there are there is some cost savings associated with that. Um, but the problem is when one of those systems breaks, uh, let's say your frame breaks. Mm -hmm. and this is some. This is a game I play that keeps oh, me up at night. Oh, your power supply. Right. Yeah, it's a game I play where, like, uh, what would I do if I showed up to set and this didn't work? Right. right. If your if your frame is broken, um, with those kind of systems, you're really in trouble because the modules don't exist on their own. Correct. Whereas with this kind of system, you can just pop the receivers out, and then they're just four stereo receivers. Yeah. So if your power supply breaks, replace the power supply because it's DC power. Right. 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 Um, if the A10 is damaged, you can pull the receivers and replace it with an A10. Right. But if one of your receivers is damaged or, I don't know, freezes or something mm -hmm. happens mm -hmm. to it, pull out that one channel. Right. And it's a, it's a very practical way to troubleshoot. Just turn your transmitter on, tune all your receivers to that one frequency and listen channel, receiver channel by receiver channel on your console until sure. you narrow down the, the one that's behaving mm -hmm. in an unusual way. And that only, that, that's not limited to audio. It's to limit, it, you can see it in RF as well. Yeah. You look at your RF meters across all your receivers and if all of them are tuned to the same frequency, but I don't know, the second slot receiver, uh, RF meter is two bars down while everyone is full strength, right. there's something going on on that, so right? And it's very easy mm. to deal with in this kind of configuration. Correct, um, correct. Whereas, yeah, and that's, that's really what I, I love about this kind of configuration. Um, Troubleshooting is, on set is, is definitely an art and a science, and, and having the ability to switch back from right. one format to another format is, is, is key. Absolutely, yeah. Um, all right, and then let's talk about the Dante and some of the, you know, we, we talked about the USB uh, port. Absolutely. Um, the Dante is really interesting because, uh, you know, that's a full-on, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's eight Dante streams coming mm -hmm. out of the unit. Um, you can route them just like any other Dante signal. Um, we in Atlanta showed um, how you could power this remotely over the coax, over the Cat5 cable. Um, you know, using off-the-shelf power over Ethernet products. Oh, very cool. And that's, yeah, it's an exciting use of this. So you can really remote the receivers. Um, there is another aspect to this, which is um, you can also get software that would work over the USB port. Can, can you tell us about that? So the software that works over the USB port, uh, it, actually, it actually occupies... Uh, um, so the software is called WaveTool. Mm -hmm. And WaveTool is designed to give the user telemetry and look at the look at certain parameters of, of your production. So when you open the first of all your computer runs the wave tool software mm -hmm. and you would connect your computer to the A10 rack via the USB connection. Mm -hmm. The next step is to open wave tool and access the A10 rack and create a session if you will you want to call it that, mm -hmm. and populate the the, the wave tool software with the receivers that you wanna that you wanna look at. So wave through the USB connection, the wave tool will look at uh, RF levels at each antenna. Right. So imagine a reality show environment where you have multiple floors, let's say an apartment or a house or a hotel, and you have multiple floors, and talent has to move freely from one floor to the other. Uh, using that power over Ethernet solution that you mentioned, it's a great way to strategically locate the A10 rack remotely from where you may be mixing. Mm -hmm. So WaveTool will, uh, will allow you to see um, the the RF levels of the receivers mm -hmm. that of of the transmitters that are walking around and specifically and this is very important 
A antenna and B antenna. Right. Because in an environment like this, like this example, uh, the locations of your antennas are not always going to be aiming in the same place. They're going to be trying, they're going to try to cover a specific location. So as your talent moves from one end to the room to another end to the room, you may see RF strength go up on antenna A and then go down and then move up on antenna B. And that's how you have an idea that your talent is still coming in strong. Mm -hmm. But the other advantage to Wave Tool, this is what I really like, is that it uses the Dante network. Yeah. Uh, in order to allow you to hear that person on your computer and using Dante Virtual Sound Card. Right, you're literally routing the Dante stream using Dante Virtual Sound Card. That's just one route. You can route it you know, to other places too. And that software lets you listen to it. And it also shares it over a Wi-Fi network. So a technician Correct. can be monitoring the same information on an iPad and, Correct. and listening on the iPad. Correct. It's very, very That cool. is very, very cool. Yeah. And... The, the the more production pushes the technical limitations or or the technical boundaries, I should say, of products as well as the people operating the products, uh, these tools are becoming more and more important. Yeah, we should um, we should do another video about Wave Tool. Oh, absolutely, Definitely another video. All right, um, so back to the A10 rack, um, and we'll have links to all of this stuff uh, down below. Um, back to the A10 rack. Um, Audio uh, is analog, AES, or Dante, DC power. RF is wideband. There's no, there's you, what, just broad UHF filtering? So I think the, the, the frequency range of the A10 rack is 470 to 694, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. I'm not, I don't know if it goes if it goes higher, because I know that some other manufacturers have receivers that operate in ranges that are, that, that are above 694. Right. But it definitely occupies the the full band, like within the legal range in the U.S. Right. It it definitely covers it. And six ninety four to uh, we'll four seventy to six ninety four uh, to six oh eight is what we use in the U.S. But, but in other places, it goes to six ninety four. Right, and that'll let us use the guard band um, and the duplex gap. I believe well. so. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Good. So I wanted to turn this around real quick mm -hmm. because there's a there's a trick that I want to share. Uh, with with the viewers at home, mm -hmm. this switch, oh, this switch, <laughs> this switch uh, allows you to turn the A10 rack uh, by. In this position, it administers DC power, mm -hmm. and in this position, it does not. DC power to the antenna. Yeah, the DC bias that mm -hmm. that goes through the antenna coax. Mm -hmm. So if you're using passive antennas, there's no need to turn it on and consume your cart's battery. Right. But if you're using active antennas, it's important. But now, here's the trick. There yes. are some antennas, there are some manufacturers. We could say I'm WYSICOM is, is and, definitely one that I would yeah, say. Yeah. And I think Electro has one as well oh. that that's supposed to go from active to passive. Right. They so have if a it senses... Right. Right? It's a normally closed relay. So it's passive without power. Correct. And then the power makes it act, puts makes in all it the active, active circuitry. Yeah. So the, the trick, and you know, you got to use this very carefully yes. because it, if, if you don't use this properly, it, it could totally nip you in the butt and, and, and mess up what you're doing. But if you're in an environment that has very clean RF, mm -hmm. like you're out and you, you, you are literally in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And you're using your passive antennas just to have robust coverage in a certain area. If you do turn up the gain of your antenna to, say, 3 or 6 dB, just to kind of get a little bit further, knowing that there's no RF in, in the environment, you could technically flip this from passive to active. And it'll act ample it will turn on the amplifier in the antennas now no the the purpose of having amp amplifiers in your antennas is not to get range the purpose is to compensate the loss that goes in the cable and then the loss that happens in any passive split between the antenna and the receiver mm -hmm. the goal is for the receiver to see the same rf quantity that it would not normally see if it was connected through a coax because there's loss in the coax right and the loss is affected by uh, the length of the cable, the type of the cable, and the frequency range that you're using. Mm -hmm. So all this has to be calculated beforehand. But if you do have 
unity gain, if you will, from your directional antenna to this, and then you turn the amplifier on, you can effectively make it a little bit more sensitive. Mm-hmm. And it might give you just that little edge to, to, to go a little further. And it's a pretty cool technique, but you have to have, like, you wouldn't want to use this in a very noisy RF environment. Right. And explain why that, what happens in a noisy RF So when you, in, when you over amplify, uh, any receiver, um, what happens is that it, you know what, it would be, it would be analogous to, let's say I have a shotgun microphone. Mm-hmm. And I kind of tune it for this distance, right? Now, let's say I, I run the microphone preamp really hot. So even a whisper sounds very loud. And then you yell. What happens? You basically, the microphone, you're not going to overload the mic, but you're going to overload the preamp that that mic is feeding. Mm-hmm. It's that same effect. And it'll mm-hmm. sound louder. It'll sound distorted. It'll sound weird. So when that happens with a receiver, that distortion, if you will, causes the receiver to confuse between the intended signal and the, and the background noise, which is why you don't want to do this in a noisy environment. Yeah. And you'll cause the receiver to mute. I, I find, you know, I started mixing in the 90s. Uh, like on set. And, um, you know, RF had their own, had its own challenges. But over the years, I've seen the RF noise floor jump up on sets. And, you know, that's, my, that's where I spend a lot of my time. And, and that's where I notice. I mean, you have all of the sort of RF noise sources um, in an urban environment. Um, that have increased, including all of the kind of personal communications and the broadband services, um, speaking of which. Um, and you also have all of the RF on set. Um, I haven't been on a set where they cabled a camera in a long time. Um, so all of that wireless video. And don't forget about LED walls. LED walls are just giant noise sources. And LED lights, um, the higher end the ones are better. Lights, yeah. yeah, but the, mm. the um, you know, like... A lot of the lighting now is done by um, LED and, and, you know, the kind of high frequency switching that goes into dimming them and all of that stuff adds to the noise floor. Um, and also, high power comms. Yeah, and two-way radios, all of that stuff. So using an unfiltered amplified antenna on set, I think, is really dangerous. That's why I like going passive. Yeah, um, or filtered. Oh, uh, what, uh, wrap it up, is Joe, <laughs> Joe saying. Move on. Um, good advice. Uh, anyways, um, so yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I, you know, I think it's, I, I do think I'm talking to Joe now. Um, I do <laughs> think it's um, important to kind of, uh, you can't just talk about the product. You got to talk about like the, the applications and the, and the use case. And, yeah, yeah. All right. Anyways, um, well, I, I mean, I think, I think we've covered a lot of ground. The A10 rack, it, you know, I think part of its beauty is its sort of simplicity in a way Mm -hmm. like it's four receivers in and you know a bunch of audio out and um thoughtful rf distribution and dc power and uh there's a real there's a uh, a tip that i would like to show on how to get things set up pretty quickly sure so please one of the things that i like about the a10 wireless and I'm going to focus on how to set up frequencies for the A10 wireless uh, mm-hmm. uh, in, in this example. Is that, Well, all of these receivers have a scan feature, but I want to show something specific about the A10 wireless scan feature that it, you can do a full band scan, but you also have these 25 megahertz divisions that calm blocks, if you will, that uh, allow you to focus specifically on an area that you want to that you want to scan and and the advantage to that is that it's faster to scan. it's a lot faster uh-huh. despite the receivers being wide band the transmitters uh in the the u.s band transmitters are 78 megahertz wide and 90 megahertz wide respectively so the first a band is 78 megahertz wide and the b band is 90 megahertz wide Mm -hmm. so there's no need to tune outside of the band of your transmitter and here in this example i have uh two transmitters that are a Mm -hmm. and two transmitters that are b so if i want to scan the a band for example i can start with 470 to 495 and then i can come to this receiver and go to the scan feature in this guy and then scan let's um, let's show it to the camera sorry and go to this receiver and scan the first chunk of the B-band. 
and I'll hit enter on both. And that's how quick it is to find some open oh. spectrum. So I, I, I'm going to try to scooch over on the A band because mm -hmm. I don't like what I find here. So I'm going to back out and then I'm going to come back in and then scan into the next 25 megahertz chunk of the A band and see if I find something that's a little bit better. Well, that doesn't make it better, does it? Hey, New York, New York's rough. Yeah. I think the lower band was was a lot cleaner. Yeah. So we'll go to that one. After seeing the three scenarios, come over here and we'll we'll look for the empty spectrum here. But in this one, this one was pretty pretty quick to, to find some spectrum. Mm -hmm. So what uh what I'd like to do here is move the cursor down from the top and find an open part of the spectrum where I know that I can use as a starting point. Here, just, yeah, your camera's right behind your finger. There oh, you I'm sorry. No, that's why I can't see the. There we go. So let's see here. It looks like from 1613 or 1612 on down. So what that 1612 means, 1612, 16 is a TV station that you're on. So mm -hmm. that's TV channel 16, mm -hmm. which is which is not on the air. Mm -hmm. uh, and 12 is a sub channel. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that any frequency in the A band that goes from 16 all the way down to to 1, what's well, what? To 6. I have clean frequencies. So I'm going to set this channel on 16.6. Right. And I would just caution people in... Um, Major metropolitan, major, uh, what they call major economic areas, there are T-band frequencies um, that you want to um, be aware of when you're down uh, this low in this, in this 470 band. And I think channel 16 is a T-band frequency in New York. Okay, so up. then we would have to find something outside of this. Right. Um, but the theory behind looking at uh, a starting point, yeah, I don't have to rescan the next band. Right. And so this would be technically technically uh, programmed. And then if I come here to the B band, I do the same thing. So this one from 2811 on down. So I can set this frequency to 2811. And then I go to channel two, and I don't need to do another scan. Let's just take a minute to focus. Two, oh. So I can go to 28. And that's TV channel 28. TV channel 2808. Yep, which is off the air. So here, 2811, 2808, these frequencies are clean and programmed. Same thing here. So now, the next step would be to just come to the transmitters, mm -hmm. turn them on, and program them. Now, note one thing, when you're programming transmitters, Whenever you're doing that and all the transmitters are next to each other, this is intermod world. Right. These transmitters are linear and they won't generate an intermod when you use them the way they're supposed to be used, which means you're on a pack and I'm on a pack. And, you know, as long as, even if we were, in the, uh, you know, in arms and, and, and very close to each other, our body wouldn't, pre would prevent those INDs from, from really transmitting. Mm -hmm. But when they are this close to the receives and this close, mm -hmm. all bunched up together, you want to avoid that. Mm -hmm. So if you do, if you program the frequencies and you, they start acting up, what you want to do is see if they act up once they're on the talent. Because well, that's or, the real world environment. Sp spread them out a little bit, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So then you would come here and just program. Do you want to tell me what the frequencies are in this one was? Uh, sure. So I think there were 16. Uh, 1606 or 1608. So 16... There we go. You can also do this with the Bluetooth app. And then the frequencies on this guy was 2811 and 2808. Nice. And there we go. Beautiful. 
All right. When the green light is on, that means that uh, the system is locked. It's also an error correction indicator. All right. Well, let's um, for the audio for the A10 specific stuff. We'll do. We'll save that for the next video. Sure. Um, but I, that's a great tip to like. Yeah, you can have multiple receivers scanning different chunks all at once. Exactly. Saves exactly. And just scan it in the of band time. of your transmitter and save time that way. Yeah. Um, any any questions, Joe, from from the audience? Any any? Uh... We had one question. Mm -hmm. uh, can this work with the sound devices six three three six six four six eight eight? I mean, um, I, I I can answer that. I think. Go for it. Um, yeah, I mean, an analog is analog, and analog and, and even go yes, yes, yeah, yes yeah. as well. Yeah. So yeah, it will work with uh, with those recorders. Yeah, um, I but there's no uh, like this six eight eight can't control the. 8 that is correct. Yeah. There's no super slot right. control. Uh, right. That's why I showed you how to quickly use the scan feature of the A tens in order to accelerate setup. Uh, can I can I forward that suggestion to the suggestions department of of uh, Super Slot Control? Absolutely, oh, absolutely. Could. One of the things that the the viewers should re know is that the A10 wireless and the A10 rack is not our last system. It's our first, and so the company is you know now that Audio Limited and Sound Devices are one, we're paying attention to what uh, the early adopters are saying and commenting, as well as those that are considering uh, making that move towards audio limited, mm -hmm. we're, we're listening to them Great. because this is, uh, this is new for us as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. It's territory. really cool. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and that's it. All right. I think uh, we will wrap this video up. Excellent. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for watching. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll put uh, put your comments and questions in the in the comment place below. Um, visit us at the video archives at Gotham Sound TV. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest news, uh, ideas, uh, and questions to info at GothamSound.com. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you, Gabriel. Thanks, thank you, guys. crew. Absolutely, it was been a pleasure. We'll see you next time.